We will continue on the theme for the month, this morning. The month is the month of manifestation of fruits. And this morning I'll be speaking on bearing fruits. Bearing fruit. The text is John chapter 15, verse 1 to verse 8. John chapter 15, verse 1 to verse 8. I read, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean. Because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Praise the Lord. Amen. In this scripture, we hear Jesus speaking, using the meta metaphor of the vine and the vine dress dresser and the branches to explain our relationship with him and with the Father and the product of that relationship. First, maybe we should talk about fruit. What is fruit? The Greek word for fruit is karpos, which refers to the natural product of a living thing. As children of God, our natural product is what Jesus is calling in this text this morning, fruit. And this fruit is not produced by us, but is produced in us by the Holy Spirit. It's not produced by the Christian himself, but by the Holy Spirit working in us and working it out in us. You will notice that throughout this scripture that I have read this morning, John 4, 15, verse 1 to verse 8, that the word there is fruit, is singular. It doesn't say fruits. It says fruit. This speaks of a unified whole, not independent characteristics, but a unified whole. As we grow, all the characteristics of Christ will begin to manifest in our lives. Like physical fruits need time to grow, spiritual fruit, the fruit of the spirit, also need time to grow. The fruit of the Spirit will not ripen in our lives overnight. Like a successful gardener must battle against weeds in order to enjoy the sweet fruit that he desires, we must constantly work to rid our lives of the weeds of our old sinful nature. That nature 
that wants us to do produce other fruit that is not the fruit of the spirit. That nature that wants to choke, choke out the work of the spirit in us. The Holy Spirit gives us the power we need to reject those old sinful desires. And we can say no to anything that does not glorify God. And we can accept God's own way out that he faithfully provides through his spirit's leading in our lives. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13, it says, No temptation has taken you, except such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, we also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. And so the Holy Spirit working within us enables us to be able to bear and then makes a way for us to bear and to escape the temptation that is before us at any point in time. As we give the Holy Spirit control of our lives, he begins to do in and through us what only he can do, which is to shape us and to grow us to look more and more on a daily basis like Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 17 to verse 18 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. What do we see here? We see a confirmation of what Jesus said in John chapter 15. If you look at John chapter 15, Jesus said in verse 3, he says, you are already cleansed because of my word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. And then if you go down to verse 7, it says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and so on and so forth. This scripture I read, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, from verse 17 and verse 18 says, Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, as you behold the word of God, as you read the word of God, as you study the word of God, as you meditate in the word of God, as you obey the word of God, as you live out the word of God, what happens? You are transformed to the image of the word who is Jesus from glory to glory. That's what the scripture is saying here. God's goal for all his children is to be like Jesus. That's why the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, it says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. To be conformed to the image of his son. The reason why he called us to be his children is for us to be conformed, to be transformed and become the image of his son. He said that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So it is God, God's plan and God's goal is for each and every one of us to be transformed till we conform to the image of Christ. So that Christ is the firstborn among look-alikes. Am I making sense to you? Among look-alikes, because when we look like him, that is the firstborn among, among look-alikes, children of God. Simply put, fruit is a change of life. A Christ-centered life. A life where we have died to ourselves. So that Christ begins to live through us. Galatians chapter 2, verse 19 and verse 20 says, 
For I through the Lord died to the law that I might live to God. And listen to verse 20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Fruit is when we now live our lives for God. Not for ourselves, but for God. When you begin to live your life for God, then you have begun to bear fruit. Then you have become, you are becoming the image of Christ. A life that seeks to satisfy God rather than self or people is a life that bears fruit. A life that is focused on whose central theme is and whose priority is God is a life that bears fruit. God expects us to bear fruit. And that's why he said in verse 2 B that every brand sorry verse 2 A every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away because he's expecting that every branch will bear fruit and we are the branches and so it is important that you and I look into our lives and ask ourselves these questions am I bearing fruit or am I just going with emotion Am I bearing fruit? Or am I just playing religion? Am I bearing fruit? Or does my life have a resemblance to those in the world? Matthew chapter 7 verse 20 says, By, his fruit, by their fruits, you shall know them. So are you bearing fruits at all? And if you are bearing fruits, what fruit are you bearing? Are you bearing fruit that men will see and give glory to your name? Are you bearing fruit that men will look at and they will think this one looks like Jesus? The Bible talks about the Christians in Antioch where Christians were first called Christians. They looked at them and they said these ones are Christ-like. These ones are Christ-like. It means that they bore fruit. What are the things that when they look at you will show that you bear fruit? It's simply the fruit of the Spirit. Our lives as Christians must be characterized by this fruit as it is dangerous for it not to be so. We must bear fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 and 23 Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 and verse 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. When people look at your life, do they see love? I'm going to talk more about this next week. I thought I'd be able to do so this morning, but... We will not be able to, but we will get there next week. Do they see these nine characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit that I have just read from Galatians 5? Are you producing fruit? Is it true that you are producing fruit? Is it possible that instead of love, you are producing bitterness? You are producing hatred. You are producing prejudice. Prejudice. Instead of joy, is there constant gloom? Instead of peace, is there turmoil? Instead of gentleness, is there a short temper? Instead of faith, is there endless worry? Instead of meekness, is there pride and arrogance? Instead of self-control, are you a victim? Of your own passions. If so, it's either if you are not releasing yourself, submitting yourself in the hands of the Holy Spirit, 
all that, you are just playing religion. Religion is that thing that people receive or they walk into and it gives them a sense of godliness but does not impact their lives to the point of transformation. When somebody has a form of religion and there's no transformation and there's no change, there is no impact, he's not looking more and more like Jesus on a daily basis. He's not looking like that new creation. All things passing away. All things having become new. Then something is amiss. If you are a Christian, then people should be able to look at you and find the fruit of the Spirit. People should be able to look at you and find the fruit of the Spirit. The Bible says in John 15 verse 8, and I'm reading the New Living Translation. John 15 verse 8. My true disciples produce much fruit. This brings great glory to my Father. And then he said in Matthew 7 20, which I mentioned before, by their fruits you will know them. In the case of bearing fruit for a Christian, it specifically means to be producing something similar to the attributes of the vine. For example, a vine can produce grapes and the fruit that is born must be similar in nature and in quality to the vine. The vine cannot produce oranges. The key is that fruit that, is, that must be born must be of the same type, of the same quality, and of the same substance from the tree or the vine that is coming from. So it is, it, so it is with the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit must look like Jesus. The fruit that you bear must look like Jesus. You cannot be a child of God and bear fruit of a child of the world. There is a difference between the child of God and the child of the world or the child of the devil. What does it mean to bear fruit? Bearing fruit is a phrase to, be, to describe it, um, the outward actions that result from the inward condition of a person's heart. It is the outward action that results from the inward condition of a person's heart. So whatever fruit we see tells us what the heart looks like. So what does your heart look like? Jesus told his followers in John 15 verse 16, I choose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. This tells me something. On one hand, I'm excited about it. On the other hand, I'm thinking, Lord, bear more fruit in me. Now, when I look at the scripture, the first thing I see is that God has chosen me to bear fruit. It means it is one of the things that God has chosen me to do. It's one of the things that God has chosen me to achieve. So it is first of all that I would bear fruit because God has already chosen me, ordained me, anointed me to bear fruit. All I need to do is to agree with the Holy Spirit to produce this fruit in my life. How do we bear fruit? And I'm just going to mention two points according to our text of today. How do we bear fruit? Jesus told us clearly in, one, in John chapter 15, verse 4 and 5, it says, Abide in me, and I in you. And then he goes on to say, Abide in me, and my words abide in you. He said also that you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. And so my point number one is abide in him and his word. For you to bear fruit, you have to abide in Christ and in his word. What does it mean to abide? Abide is to live in, to dwell in, to stay with. That's what abide means. So 
abide in Jesus, who is the vine. As a branch, stick to him. Stay connected to him. So this scripture talks about connection. It also talks about dependence. It also talks about, talks about continuance. When you say he abided with me, he stayed with me. It's continual. I'm going to mention, I'm going to talk about this three. Abide in me means one, connection. Abide in Jesus means a life-giving connection. He is the one that gives life. Immediately that there's a disconnection, immediately the branch is cut off, life cuts off. That's what happens. A branch cannot survive if it's not connected to the vine. This is what the theologians call union with Christ. This union, this connection is mutual. If you look at the verse that I read earlier, John 15 verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. So as you are abiding in him, he is abiding in you by his spirit. Mark you. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30. It says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Grieve not the Holy Spirit with whom you have been sealed. So we abide in him and he also abide in us and we will not do anything that will grieve him, that will cause him to withdraw or be quiet. So it speaks of connection. If there's no connection, there is no life. If there's no life, there is no fruit. Secondly, dependence. Now this dependence Connection is two ways. When you abide in him, he abides in you. But dependence is one way. The branch is dependent on the vine. It's dependent on the vine for life. It's dependent on the vine for nutrients so that it can grow and bear fruit. You will notice in natural, can you call it biology or botany or what do they call it now? Which one? It doesn't matter. <laughs> no, that's not it. Sap flows from the vine <laughs> to the branch. <laughs> Supplying its water and minerals and all manner of nutrients that will make it to grow. As believers, believe it or not, sap flows from Christ. Sap flows from Christ's grace. Through our life-giving connection to him, we are completely dependent upon Jesus for everything that counts. We are completely dependent on him for every form of spiritual fruit. Apart from him, verse 5 says, we can do nothing. Apart from him, not only can we do nothing, we are nobodies. And apart from him, we are dead. Any man that does not have the Holy Spirit on the inside of him is a dead man walking. It's the Holy Spirit that brings life. And it is our dependence on him that keeps us alive. The third one, continuance. Abiding also involves continuance. Abide in the Greek word that was translated means remain. It means stay. It means continue. In John chapter 1 verse 38 and verse 39, two of the disciples who first encountered Jesus answered, Where are you staying? They wanted to know where Jesus made his residence. So the word staying is the same, is the same word that was translated as abide. So what we are saying is stay with him. Stay with the vine. Don't take holidays from the vine. Don't walk away from the vine. Don't take breaks from the vine. Breaks and holidays are not allowed. <laughs> Hallelujah. We must continually abide in him. We cannot look back like Lot's wife. We continue to look unto him, the author and the finisher of our faith. 
We continue to abide in him. This is what Jesus was talking about in John chapter 8 verse 31 and verse 32. He says, if you abide in me, he said, if my word abide in you, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Then brings in, brings in another aspect. It says, if my word abide in you, then you are my disciples. In John chapter 15, it says, if you abide in me, then you are my disciples. This simply means, brothers and sisters, that if you do not abide in him, and his word does not abide in you, you are not his disciple. I don't know what name I will call you then, maybe baby Christian. <laughs> After 25 years of being in the church. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. You will know the truth. And the truth is, it is when you abide in him, and you abide in his word, that you are his disciples. It is only then also that you know the truth. It is then also that the truth will set you free. There's no truth outside him. Whatever any other person calls truth outside Jesus, it is not truth. It is lies. Maybe it is human facts. Maybe it's human philosophy. Maybe it's human ideology. It is everything but the truth. But we know it is only the truth that will make you free. To abide in the vine means to be united to Jesus in connection. To rely on Jesus you know, independence and to remain in Jesus in continuance. A branch must stay firmly attached to the trunk to stay alive. It must be firmly attached to the vine to produce fruit. Without the vine, the branch will wither and it will die and dead branches don't bear fruit. As Jesus' disciples, we must stay firmly connected to him. We must stay firmly connected to him in relationship. A branch draws strength, nourishment, protection, energy from the vine. If it is broken off, it dies and becomes unfruitful. When we neglect our spiritual life, we ignore the word of God. We skip on prayer and withhold areas of our lives from the Holy Spirit. What happens? We die. The branch dies. I'm not talking about physical death now. I'm talking about spiritual. The branch dies. We need daily surrender. We need daily communication. We need daily, sometimes hourly repentance. We need constant connection with the Holy Spirit. We need intimacy with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not just um, a teacher in front of the lecture hall. We need intimacy with the Holy Spirit. We need to draw near to him. This is where we draw near to him that will bear fruit. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 says, Walk in the spirit so that you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. When we walk in the spirit, then we will not sin against him. When we stay with him, then we will draw strength from him. When we wait on him, like Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31 says, then we will not grow weary. When we abide in him, then we will not grow weary in doing well. God will help us and enable us to abide with him and stay there with him and remain in him so that we can bear fruit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Number two, how do we bear fruit? By God's pruning. Through God's pruning. Do you know what it means to prune? I don't know a lot about gardening. But I had a few lectures from Elaine and from Phil. And they taught me to always chip off. Even Elaine gave me the scissors. I don't know what that gardening scissors is called. To cut off. Clippers. Clippers, thank you. <laughs> to cu cut off that end that is dying. And I've been doing this. And I've been doing this for two years. Something happened. Last year, I cut off the ends from my roses. I have two roses in my garden. And this year, when my roses came out, whoa! I had many roses. I thought, wow, so this is what it does. There's another plant, I forgot the name of that one. It has purple flowers. It was filled. In fact, he cut it with his own hands when he came you know, to my garden.
garden, was it last year or so? By the time the thing came out this year, I'd never seen so many purple flowers, you know, on that thing. And look, what am I saying to you? Pruning makes us bear much fruit, more fruit, more fruit. If you want more fruit, submit yourself and surrender yourself to the pruning of the vine dresser. And God, the Father, is the vine dresser. dresser. The process of fruitfulness through pruning is painful. Pruning is painful, isn't it? Very, very painful. But every tree that will bear much fruit needs pruning. My brother, my sister, do you submit to God's pruning? Or do you run away from God's pruning? In the body of Christ, the moment God begin, brings out the clippers, as it were, and begins to cut that area that is dying, we begin to kick and rant and shout and talk about what God has done wrong. But for us to bear fruit, God needs to cut it off. That area that is causing destruction for us, he needs to cut it off. That area that is drawing our hearts away from him, he needs to cut it off. That area that has almost become a God to us, he needs to cut it off. When he's cutting it off, do not rebel. Submit yourself under the mighty hand of the Almighty. Amen. Let him do that that only he can do. The Bible makes us to understand that who he lost, he chastises. And Hebrews chapter 12 verse 11 says, Now, no chastening seem to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. My brother, my sister, yield yourself in the hand of the Almighty. Yield yourself to, in, in the hand of God for his pruning. Do not complain. Do not rebel. Let him finish his work. Do you know that sometimes some of the things we complain about that are not so palatable, it is the Lord pruning us. Yeah. It is the Lord working in us. You would have heard me many times say from this altar that right now I'm in meekness class 3. I'm sure you've heard that before. <laughs> Tomorrow I'll come to you and i say I'm in patience class 2. Because God has just sent somebody into my life that if I'm not patient, I will pull out my hairs. And so, that's what I mean when I say God has put me in patience class 3. Because last year, there was a situation that tried my patience. That was class 1. This year, there's another situation or person that God has sent to teach me patience. That will be Richard. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He said it, I didn't. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But you see, when those things happen, I should not go be, be uh, outside the screen. When those, I said to Richard this morning, I don't know how to preach from the pulpit anymore. You know, when those things happen, how do you take it? One of the things that we were taught as newcomers is when things begin to happen in your life, contrary to what you expected, check with God. The first thing you do is, God, what am I to learn from this? Where are you going with this? Because nothing happens unless the Lord allows it. So you must say, Lord, what are you teaching me in this? Many years ago, 19 years ago now, God said to me, 20 years ago, sorry, 20 years ago, God said to me in my bedroom, we were living in Houston, Texas at this point. He said to him, prepare for your next assignment. I said, yes, Lord. So we went into prayer and fasting and all that and all that. Two months later, my husband's office came and said, we are transferring you to the UK. It was his job that took us to Houston as well. We are transferring you to the UK. I said, okay, is this the next assignment? 
So one of our friends, a very dear brother in Houston, in the church in Houston, said, I have a friend in London who is a pastor. In fact, that phone number that Pastor Demo uses today, he gave us that phone. And we never changed the number. He said, oh, you can go to his church. I've been there before, a lovely church. Now, God told me, told you prepare for your next assignment. I got to the UK. I didn't say, Lord, what's the next assignment? We went looking for the brother's friend. We went to his church. And every Sunday, during the praise and worship, Vesta has had me say this before, I will cry from the beginning to the end. People looking at me will think, oh, what's a tender heart? Worshipping before God. No, that was not what it was. I was crying, I was asking God, Lord, what am I doing here? Lord, what is my next assignment? Everything was working against the assignment. I couldn't even lift a finger in that congregation. I saw Pastor said, Lord, show me. Teach me why I brought you here. Why, why you brought me here. God said you walked in there by yourself, but I'm going to use it as your class three meekness. And so it was my class three meekness. I went through fire and water. And then I came out. I learned meekness all over again. In conclusion, God's goal for all his children is for us to be like Jesus. For who he foreknew, he put this predestined to become, to be conformed to the image of the Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. The Holy Spirit is constantly working in you and working in me to rid us of acts of the sinful nature and display his fruits, fruits in us and through us instead. Therefore, the presence of the fruit of the Spirit is the evidence that our character is becoming more like Christ's character. And so I want to encourage you, apply yourself, think about fruit, bearing fruit of the Spirit all the time. Allow the Lord to finish his work through you. And I end by reading the scripture a second time. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, verse 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Lord is, there is liberty. But we are with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by His Spirit. I encourage you, surrender yourself to the Holy Spirit, so that He will change you and change me, you know, daily from glory to glory into the image of the Son.